Okay, I need to be careful because I've, I've got a message to preach, but I feel compelled to just say a, a brief comment a, apart from that. So, so I'm going to try to be quick about this. It just occurred to me as, as we were worshiping together and praying together that in the book of Revelation, the things that stand out and matter about what we have done that are called to mind are the righteous deeds of the saints and their prayers. And so it just struck me as, as we, we were praying together that the things that actually mattered the most today were not the widget that you, know, that you built or helped to build or, or the, the, you know, the test that you took at school or whatever. Um, it's not to say those don't matter, but, the, the, but these, these prayers and the kind of lives that we live in righteousness, those are things that will last forever and so I just felt like we should felt like I should say that that this matters so much the things that you're you're doing and and participating in thank you for that Um, okay I'm going to move now the ginormous super giant print that's literally what it is super giant print bible right here Um, in fact if you've never seen a super giant print bible at some point just come look at that you'll you'll get one for yourself but um, first John Uh, Chapter 2 is the passage we're going to talk about tonight. And um, I saw an article yesterday, really good news article, about a French company that, uh, well actually it's a, I don't know if the company, there's a French company working with some scientists who developed uh, an antibody test for the uh, COVID-19 virus that they say they can test for for antibodies in a minute with just a finger prick. They develop a test, finger prick, you know, nor- the process now is weeks. You go in, do blood work, they take a vial and it, it comes back weeks later and you find out. But they've got a test that they've developed, a pin prick, uh, and in less than a minute's time can show that a person has, uh, has these antibodies. Which, and the significance of that, of course, is that that provides a level of confidence that test provides a level of confidence because if you've got those antibodies then what you know that's proof positive that you had the virus that there was an immune response that your body has an immunity now that's the significance of knowing that information and um, the, the, the as I thought about this text that is a good picture for what this test is about it's the idea that if I have a certain piece of information that it can be proof positive for something else, okay? So, so you may remember from last week that when, when we come to the first letter that John wrote, he's writing to, to Christians in, in and around Ephesus, several churches that he was uh, worshipped with and, and taught and led as, a, as an apostle and elder. And, and, uh, and what had happened was that there were disputes. People were preaching uh, they were preaching Jesus, but it was like a different kind of Jesus. They were saying they had a, a, a sort of better understanding of things, and this better understanding of things was different than the apostolic message, than, than the faith that was once for all handed down to the, to the saints uh, from Jesus and his apostles. And so, so that, that created a, a lot of doubt and confusion and, and, and division and so on. And uh, we've been talking about that the last couple of weeks. But we come to this week, what, what John is going to say is, is, is primarily directed toward building Christian confidence. So w- when I say Christian confidence, some, some uh, similar phrases that we, you might have heard before or have used, sometimes we say in our, in, in our circles, assurance of salvation. Who's ever said or heard that, that expression, assurance of salvation? That's the idea that, that a Christian can know that he has been saved and that he will when he when he faces God's final judgment that he will be saved right Um, so I've entitled this message how we know that we know and I'm getting that right right from the text that you'll see it in just a minute but how we know that we know and uh, I want to state kind of more fully what what John's going to do or has done in this passage and I hope to show you so so here's the 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 essential idea that we're going to work with tonight the idea is that the outworking of God's love for us. God loves us. The outworking of God's love for us can be seen 
in our own Christ-like love and obedience. And, and, and that, that Christ-like love and obedience is a sure sign, a proof positive, it's the antibody, right? If you see that, then you know that God's love has had its effect on that person. Okay, that's the essential idea. So let's read the passage and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll develop it further. Beginning in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, the Apostle John writes, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, and just by the way, translating that, you, 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 it, you could rightly translate it, and when anybody sins, that's the sense of it. It's not a question. When anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in the same manner as he, referring to Jesus, walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Would y'all pray with me? Uh, Father, my prayer is that right now you would speak to me and through me, help me to show the things that I've seen in your word uh, in my study. And I pray that you would use this to build Christian confidence, the assurance of salvation, to strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now again, the essential idea tonight is that the outworking of God's love in us to save us can be seen by the presence of Christian love or Christ-like love and obedience. Now, there's a, there's a sort of logic that's just, it's real simple, uh, but I want to draw it out. He doesn't ever spell it out, but I want to draw it out that, that sort of undergirds everything that's said here. And the logic is, is three steps. One is God, God loves us. God loves the world. He loves us. This, the second step is that when we receive God's love for us, which comes to us through Jesus Christ, we experience forgiveness and we begin to love and obey God just as Christ loved and obeyed God the Father, right? And step three, therefore, whenever we express Christ-like love and obedience, it is a sure sign that God's love has had its effect on us and we have truly come to know God in a saving relationship. That's the, that's the logic that undergirds the, the language in this, in this passage. So um, what we're going to see uh, in, in what follows is sort of three uh, expressions of that principle. How do we know that we know? Well, the first way that we know that we know is we know because of what Christ has done for us. That's in uh, the first two verses. Let's read those again. My little children, by the way, that's a, a, a diminutive, it's an effect, affection kind of thing. He's, he's expressing affection. My little children, I write, uh, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, what John is uh, telling us here is that Christian confidence begins not by looking at ourselves, but by looking at what Christ has done for us. We look at Christ. That's the foundation, the beginning of Christian confidence confidence in other words the confidence that we are loved by God the confidence that we are accepted by God comes from looking at and believing what Christ accomplished for us 
Now, I imagine that's not controversial uh, in this room. But in my experience, um, it, this does often uh, disappear from our view whenever we start to think about how do I know that I know. It's, you say it out loud and everybody's going to say yes. But then when you're sitting there wondering, am I really saved? Is God really, am I really okay with God? Are things going to, is all well? You wonder that first and foremost because this has disappeared from view. Another way to put that is, I doubt there's anyone here who genuinely believes uh, that he or she is without sin of any kind. Um, yeah, if you think that, then talk to me afterwards. That's a different... But, but actually last week, the text we covered last week was primarily more directed to, to people on sort of philosophical grounds who would have said, I, I, sin, sin is not a problem for me. They wouldn't necessarily have said they didn't do this or this, this other kind of deed that, that Christians call sin, but they would have said sort of, I don't... I, I don't have the guilt that you, the sin guilt that you say I have. That was last week. This week, the focus is on Christians. By this we know. How do we know? How do we know that we know? And one of the things that happens is, is Christians are aware of how sh- short they fall from God's standard, from his holiness, from what he's worth, right? We, the, 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 um, the experience of Christians throughout the ages has, has typically led them to say things like, man, the, the, the closer I seem to get to God, the more I'm aware of my sin, right? And so I, I, I'm saying tonight that this passage provides a much needed correction to those of us who are inclined to doubt our salvation because we are not yet sinless. Yeah, I think it's, it's entirely likely that there are people here tonight I know there are on Sunday morning. I've just lived too long. Uh, there, it's entirely like there are people here tonight uh, who are inclined to, to, to doubt that they're really saved. I'm not really saved. Because uh, you, you look at yourself and you see how much you fall short. You say, I, I don't, do I really know God? You know, am I, I'm not doing well enough, right? I'm not doing well enough. And I would say there's a time in my life where I was inclined to think this way. But I, I want to be very plain you have to get that out of your head. That's not from God. It's not at all biblical. In fact, it's fundamentally at odds with the gospel. So it's a dead end to think like that. So if my being rightly related to God was a matter of my doing well enough, then Christ died needlessly in the words of the Apostle Paul. Died needlessly. On the contrary, what we know is that Christ died purposefully. What exactly was he dying for? We must remember that. Was he not dying for those very sins that rack us with guilt and cause us to see the unrighteousness that must separate us from God? Those sins, those very ones that you're looking at when you doubt, those are the very ones Christ died for. Along with the ones you can't even see. This is the gospel. This is the good news, that Christ died for our sins, our real sins, the one we we actually think about. (laughs) He died for those. And that having accomplished redemption for us through that death, we will follow him in this resurrection, passing out of death forever into eternal life. Christian confidence at bottom, how we know that we know Christian confidence at bottom is because we're looking at what Christ did for us if you are here tonight and you would say yeah Justin I'm that person I'm the one who you know if you let me I would get baptized ten times or you know or I I need to say I, I, I say quote unquote the prayer over and over again because I, I, I do, I doubt, I'm, I'm not sure that I really am okay with God. Um, the answer is, is not for you to do better. It's not this time I'm going to say the prayer again and then I'll do, I'll, I'll do differently, you know, I'll do better next time, right? That's not the answer. 
And I emphasize it because in my experience, this, 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 the reality of the gospel, of Christ, what Christ actually did for our sins, somehow it just disappears from view when we most need it. That can't be from God. And I know it's not true. The answer is not to do better. If you have any grasp on the holiness of God and the shameful offense that your own unrighteousness is, then you know it will never, you'll never do enough to make those sins okay. We all know that our, our attempts at righteousness, sincere and well-meaning, are fitful, erratic, spasmodic, right? We, 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 we start and we're inconsistent and we do good and then, oh, you know. The answer is not doing better. The answer is not in, the, in, the, in the, that theological phrase, sinless perfectionism. That's not the answer. That is not the ground of Christian confidence. The answer is Christ. We must look to Christ and see the justification that we can't find for ourselves in ourselves. That's how we know that we know. We must look to Christ and see him bearing away those very sins that rack us with guilt. We must look at Christ and see that God loves us and that he's forgiven us and that he has accepted us in Christ. And in a phrase I love that I picked up this week reading a book and that all is well. That ought, I mean, Christians ought to be able to say that to one another. That's the truth. Brothers and sisters, all is well. That's why we call it gospel. I know the, the, the term, you know, means a lot. It's good news. All is well. Now, I cannot stress enough that this gospel, this good news, is the bedrock of Christian confidence. This assurance of salvation must be built on this or it won't stand. If you skip this, nothing else I say will matter. It won't stand. You have to have this, a foundation. Now we can move on uh, with this foundation. We can move on to the rest that, that the Apostle John says here. The next thing that we're going to see is that we know because we obey. All right, let's read that. This is verse 3 uh, to 2. Uh, well, we'll read this 3 to 6. By this way we know that we have come to know him. Excuse me, by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Okay. We know because we obey. I have this saying that I use sometimes with Melissa, and it's an inside joke. It comes from a book that we both like. But you'll ask me to do something, and I'll, I'll look up at her and I'll say, to hear is to obey, my love. And, uh, and, and, and the reason it's a joke, uh, the reason the joke works, the reason it's funny, is because it's, it's, it's part true and part not true, right? There's, it's, it's extreme. It's beyond what is really normal, but, but actually it, it's funny because there is some reality running through it. And so she knows when I say that, that actually what I mean is to compliment her. Because what I'm doing is I'm, 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 I'm expressing the result of her love for me. I'm looking at her saying, this is the effect you've had on me. This is the power of your loveliness. This is what you've done to me. Look at me. As stubborn, hard-headed, rebellious as we both know that I am by nature. Look at me. Just a word and I'm ready to get up and do whatever you say. Now we all know that the sentiment in that is better than the practice in real life. But there's still truth there. There's still something something true about that and the apostle John is saying something like that we have been so affected so changed by God's love that we are indeed ready ready to respond to his voice and the essential idea that gets expressed in in terms of two antithetical ways of life in the interest of time I won't belabor the 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 interpretive approach here 
But suffice it to say that when John says keep his commandments in view of what he says in the rest of this letter, including the, the, the previous point that we just talked about, this is not another, oh, you know, you, you, you sinned, so therefore you, you don't love God. No, that's not the picture. What, what he's contrasting are two different ways of life. And there's, there's one way of life that is characterized by a pattern of responsiveness to God's voice, to his commands, to his word. What he says, we want to do that. There's a way of life that, that, that is characterized in those terms. Now, there's another way of life that's characterized by its opposite. There's no readiness to respond to God's commands. There's no desire to do what he wants or to be pleasing him. Nothing like that, right? Two different ways of life. What is John saying, right? We know by this, this doesn't just happen. This only happens when people have been affected by God's love for them through Christ. It gets a little confusing, and I'm just going to tell you, if you're interested in technical, syntactical details, how I come up with what I'm going to say next, you're going to have to ask me afterwards, because I'll get bogged down trying to explain it, and I'll probably, probably lose you because I'm not up to it. But what I can say here is, to make it simple, when, when, when John writes that by this we know that the love of God has been truly perfected, we could read that in all kinds of ways. Love of God, what is that? Is that God's love for us? Is that our love for God? Is that the love that we show to other people that God put inside of us? And I could keep going. Because of the underlying syntax, there there are lots of options for how you could read that. You determine it by context. And as it turned out, sometimes contextually, multiple options look good. So this is as far as I'm going. If you want to know more, you can ask me after. I'm just going to tell you how I would render it here in light of the context is best to understand it. This is how we should read it. Whoever keeps his, God's word, truly in this person, God's love is accomplished. Whoever keeps God's word, truly in this person, God's love is accomplished. In other words, when you see a person obeying God, you are seeing a person who has been changed by God's love for them. Now what John does next is to give another argument from the same principle. And for those of you that don't know this, there's a guy in the 16th century, very helpfully, who, who, who took the biblical text and he added verse numbers. So like the Apostle John wrote a letter. He didn't write, you know, some words and then stick a little one superscript by it. So he didn't do that. We added that later to help us be able to say, oh, at this point in John's letter. Um, and this is one of those places where you get kind of tripped up by the, by the verse numbering. The uh, end of verse 5 actually goes with verse 6. So you should read it. The next step is where John says, by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he, referring to Jesus, walked. What is the point? People who say they are in Christ, man, stands to reason they might look like they're in Christ, right? They might, if, if they're followers of Christ, they're probably gonna look like they're following him, right? They're gonna look like they're living the same kind of of life that Jesus lived. And so let's restate the logic behind this obedience. If we, if we see a person whose way of life demonstrates a pattern of obedience to God, the same pattern we see in Jesus' life, then something has happened to bring that about. People don't do that incidentally, right? It doesn't just accidentally or without intention happen. If somebody is trying to obey Christ, something happened. That's not normal, that's just not accidental. And so, the people that do that mean to do that. They mean to live, live lives like this. That's the, the point John is making. And people that mean to live lives like that got that way only one way. There's only one way they get that way. And that is that the love of God directed toward them through Christ has taken root in their lives and had its effect. That's the, that's the sense for it. Now, um, before, we, uh, before we move on, let me stress that John's stated purpose in this letter is for Christians to know, to know that they know God and have eternal life. 1 John five thirteen, very end of the letter, he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I want you to know that you know, <laughs> Right? So Christian, please, 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 
don't let this beautiful ground of assurance that we have, don't let this beautiful ground of assurance become distorted by turning it into a kind of sinless perfectionism. Don't do that. We're not looking at the mistakes. We're looking at the presence of this readiness to respond to God. The fact that there is obedience, that there is a desire to walk like Christ walked. That shows up in real ways. We're not looking for all the ways it's incomplete. We're looking for the fact that it's there. Do you see it? It's a big difference. In the rest of this letter, he'll point out to this church, because they're, they're just like us. They're, just, they're people like us. He'll point out to them the things that he sees, where he can see how God's had its effect on them, how they're keeping God's word. He points it out. Why? To try to help them know what to do to have this Christian confidence. He'll point out the fact that they are trusting in Jesus. He'll point out how they've repented of sins. He'll point out how, they, how they're practicing righteousness. He'll point out how they're making spiritual progress, how they're not the same people they once were, how, how there's been growth in Christian character. And the same is true of you, brothers and sisters. So let this be what it is. You demonstrating that you know him. And John saying, hey, this is how we know. Take confidence in that. Now the final point in, in the text is, is not really a new point. It's, a, it's, a, it's another way of stating the same thing that's been said. But in such a way to give us sort of a, a completer view. And uh, again, there are some details that are kind of tricky in it. But I'm going to try to try to avoid getting bogged down in those so how do we know that we know the next step in what Paul says is or John says is we know because we love we know because we love let's read it beloved I'm not writing a new commandment to you but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning the old commandment is the word which you've heard on the other hand I'm writing to you a new commandment which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet now hates his, or hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling or for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, we see again here a contrast between what a person might say and what a person does. The contrast between what he says and what he, what he does. And this time the contrast isn't between obedience and disobedience. It's, it's between uh, love and hate. But in the end, these amount to much the same thing. For example, in Romans 13, the, the Apostle Paul says that all of God's commandments can be summed up in one word. Love. Love. The whole, all of his commandments. Love. Now, that doesn't mean that we can start with some distorted definition of love and say, well, I'm doing that, and so it doesn't matter what God said about anything else. That happens a lot today. People will throw out phrases like, you know, love is all that matters, love wins, or just, just love somebody. And what they really mean is some kind of distorted thing that they're calling love that isn't at all what God means by love. It isn't at all what Jesus' love looked like, Right? So, so when we say that you can sum up all the commandments in the word love, we mean the kind of love that Jesus exhibited. That's what we mean. Uh, when Jesus and the apostles say the whole of God's law can be summed up by one word love, they're telling us what love really is as much as they're telling us what the commandments are really about. Namely, that we love as God loves. Now, John's contrast is going to draw this out. There, there are people who claim to know God and indeed uh, to, to love God. They claim they love God, but if you look at their lives, there's no evidence that they love anybody else. And John says, this can't be true. There's no way this is true. And he expands that in another part of the letter, so I'm not going to expand it anymore here. But I'm just going to draw out what he's saying by referring to something that Jesus said. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Just that, just that simple. We're back to the to hear is to obey idea again, right? And again, we think of the pattern in Jesus' life. Loving God and loving people went hand in hand. And so here's where verse 7 fits in. John's alluding to something that Jesus said uh, that will sound quite familiar once we read it. He's like, like, 
It sounds kind of circuitous the way that he says this. I'm not writing you an old commandment, but I'm writing you a new commandment. What, what is going on? Why is he saying that, you know? Why don't you just say, I'm telling you to love people, right? Um, well, I think what he's doing is he's actually alluding to uh, a statement that he heard Jesus say when Jesus demonstrated what love really looks like to him in a very profound way, the night when uh, Jesus washed his disciples' feet and said that this was an image for the kind of love that he was showing them and would show them on that cross and that they ought to show that to, to, to one another. So this is the statement. It's in John 13. He says, a new commandment, Jesus speaking, John sitting there hearing this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all men will know, does that sound familiar, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So I think what John is doing is he's taking that statement that he heard from the lips of Jesus who had loved him so much and he's applying it now. He's flipping it around and telling it to these churches that he's writing to and he's saying your love for one another shows that you really do know God and that's that's what John means in verse 8 when he says this thing that is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light's already shining what he's saying is is that I'm writing these things with the clarity of vision that comes from seeing that God's love the true light Jesus is already shining in you the same thing that was in Jesus I can see it in you already so he's writing with that kind of clarity and saying that brothers and sisters I know I know that God's love is at work in you I can see it because he wants them to know that they know now I think the same is true I mean I look out across this room and I know uh, most of you well enough to have seen these things and to be able to say just like John says and we should say these things to one another I can see it in you Christ's light is shining in you you should know you should have confidence you should rest that all is well in Christ God's love is at work in you and so just as John points the love that he sees expressed in the lives of those to whom he's writing and says look at that that's something God put in you we need to do the same to one another Look at that. That's something God put in you. And the point is that by this we know. That doesn't just happen. God put that there. So how do we apply this as we conclude? And the application uh, is, is very straightforward in my mind. That we are being instructed by the word of God to seek Christian confidence by this means. This is the way. You want to know that you know? The first thing you better do is look at what Christ has done for you. If you try to come any other way to confidence or to an understanding of how you're related to God without considering, without thinking about the the reality of what Jesus did for your sins, you're not going to get the right answer. You're not going to understand what's going on. The only way you can build that, that, that foundation of confidence is to look at what Christ has done. This is the gospel with that foundation in place the scripture is telling us John is saying by this we know he's saying look at what God has done in your lives look at the obedience that he's brought about in your life look, look at, look, look at, the, look at the, the love that he's put in you and of course all of us with, with the accuser of the brethren right at our ear will say, look at all the ways we failed. But that's, that's not at all what he's saying. It's not about all the ways you failed. It's about what God has done for you in Christ and about what you can see that he's done in you, albeit not completely yet. But that you can see that he's put obedience in you. And all of you, brothers and sisters. I'm guessing you're not here accidentally. I think you meant to be here. I think you meant to keep God's word. I think you meant to pray with your brothers and sisters because God values that and has caused you to value. You see what I'm saying? That that doesn't happen by accident. So hear it tonight from the scripture. God loves you. You are accepted. Jesus has taken your sins away. 
you have eternal life. All is well. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful to get to preach this message and for the meaning, uh, meaningfulness of this text for me and for so many others that I've known. Thank you for causing it to be that there's a book in our Bible that has the express purpose of causing us to know that we have eternal life, to know that all is well for us because of what Christ has done for us. I pray now that uh, as we take another step this evening toward group prayer and pray uh, with one another that you would hear our prayers, help us to pray in faith and sincerity with boldness and help us to pray in accordance with your will to be humble and yet, and yet um, persistent and bold in the way that we ask. God, thank you for these brothers and sisters of mine. I pray that you would cause your blessing to rest on them, that you would be gracious to them and give them peace, and that you would cause us to be strong together in this faith that you have granted us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.